Ladies and gentlemen, I think we started late, we were 20 minutes late, um, but we've managed to finish. We have about 10, 15 minutes for questions. Um, but you, you can tell from the richness of the discussion, the presentations, that the organizers of this session uh, need, actually needs commendation. So can we give them a round of applause for its <laughs> pulling together this excellent panel? Can we take um, questions? I think we take all at a go. Then we'll try to respond. So three from my right, and then three from my left. Thank you. Uh, I'm Donald Imari from Repoa, Tanzania. Uh, I would like to just make uh, one, uh, maybe comment or, or question also to the presentation, in particularly to the crisis related to uh, oil price shock, taking the reference of Nigeria. <clears throat> we know that Nigeria has uh, actually uh, produced oil for the last uh, 60 years, over, over the last 60 years. So they have had experience in this industry. They have gone through these cycles of shocks, uh, prices going down, prices going up. So something could have been done in terms of uh, uh, using the oil resources to diversify the economy over the last 60 years. If that didn't take take place then, uh, and this crisis which has, uh, has been there for about two years, uh, what reasons do we have to believe uh, that Nigeria has the capacity to actually diversify its economy uh, to the extent that it will, uh, it will uh, uh, address some of the consequences of this shock uh, to, its, to, its, to its economy within the a short span of the coming five, five to ten years, for example. Um, and, and this question really relates to whether Nigeria in its own can do that or there is a need for a broader uh, support from the international community. And this case applies to many other developed countries, developing countries which have find themselves in such a, a situation. Thanks. Yeah, thank you very much. Yes, yeah. uh, let's be straight to the point since yes. we don't have a lot of time. Thank my uh, question is very similar to my friend Donald's, um, which is uh, uh, to Professor Ajayi. Um, if you can't get things sorted out when the oil price is high, what chance do you stand of getting them sorted out when the oil price is low on the governance issues? And um, to Wisdom, I'd be interested. Uh, this is a very interesting study that you've presented. Um, I wonder if you also have some comments on um, diamonds, alluvial diamonds and artisanal diamonds, because uh, the situation, say, in Sierra Leone, where the diamonds of uh, people are just uh, looking for them in the rivers, the artisanal alluvial diamonds are, are being sought. It's much harder to control that sort of thing than it is, uh, say, in Botswana, where you have a diamond mine that you can really control. So what chance is there of controlling the informal sector uh, in mining? in terms of tax revenue, et cetera. Thank you. Uh, so I have a uh, compliment to, uh, to our last speaker, who I thought was actually quite mindful in terms of thinking about long-term sustainability in relation to uh, resource uh, industries. And um, I guess my question would be to both our colleague from Nigeria and, and Alan, why would the economic analyses not take into account the macro perspective of, frankly, the now recognized climate change constraints, shall we say, on resource extraction? And uh, kind of similar to the first question, cannot economics advance the thinking among leaders by taking a much more sophisticated portfolio approach about diversification, even for extractive industries, much like the Saudis have announced uh, a long-term diversification of their, of their uh, economy from oil and gas, particularly for domestic use. Okay, uh, thank you. Uh, I would like the speakers, perhaps Alan, take the, the point of uh, what uh, role they see for building uh, uh, commodity stabilization funds or sovereign wealth funds in low-income countries in which you have to cut, uh, you have to build a fund, basically cut consumption, 
generate savings for a while and then starting to use those funds. And also, uh, if there is something in the experience about triggering, uh, in some country, for example, in my country in Chile, is, there is a clear rule of, for accumulating uh, resources in the fund, but it's not clear when the funds can be used in, ta in times of declining, uh, let's say, copper prices that are entirely left to the discretionary power of the Ministry of Finance or uh, Fiscal Authority. So basically, these two issues, how to build the funds in low-income countries and how to rule uh, trigger re triggering rules for, for, for using the resources when they have been accumulated. And last point, whether there is a tendency for over savings or over insurance when you build up these this funds. Thank you for the presentations. My name is Daniel Etongo from Helsinki University. And my question goes to our last presenter, Uni. You mentioned clearly about the political economy at different levels. But now the issue is like about like natural resources, like under the ground, people have different interests. So what measures have been put in place that if the trades have been taken out to get the resource beneath, how can we like try to manage the land in terms of the forest? And also to Professor Ajayi, you mentioned some very strong points on this aspect of attitude, which I think is, is very strong in most part of Africa that we believe like things cannot really change. Talking to people in different parts of Africa, yeah, it will stay like that. What, what measures do you think have been, have been put in place with your experience to try to drive a change in attitude so that we can have this positive way of thinking in the way we, we manage our resources? Right, thank you very much. Before I invite the presenters, I just want to make a quick uh, correction or um, information on Alan's uh, presentation. G GDP, the deficit figure you, you mentioned, the 12% of GDP figure you mentioned was mainly due to the elections. Um, yes, we, we borrowed. When we, we got oil, we borrowed, but we spent because of elections. The stakes were very high, and therefore government had to spend to win elections. Yeah, thank you. Now, can I invite, uh, I don't know how we'll do it. Should we go here? Yes. Yeah, so. OK, uh, so maybe let me go first. So uh, the question was about uh, mining of diamond, alluvia mining, and uh, uh, how the informal sector could be uh, controlled. Uh, there is a study we, we did recently, I did with one of my uh, PhD students, on the impact of mining on health. Uh, and then it was very clear from that study that when you look at the mining areas, uh, because of the use of uh, heavy metals, uh, arsenic, cyanide, and the way the tailings are processed, uh, individuals who are closer to the tailing sites were more likely to suffer some diseases, uh, especially uh, upper rep respiratory uh, disorders. And we were able to even put some monetary values on that. So it is true that uh, those activities have to be controlled or regulated. But there is a, some, to some extent, some political economy argument to it. Uh, governments uh, have come to believe that those within the mining communities largely depend on that for employment and livelihood. And if you try to uh, you know, control them or regulate them, you might lose some political capital. They might not vote for you. So especially during the periods of elections, uh, they actually go haywire. They, they go around uh, mining even concession areas, destroying uh, the water bodies, uh, and, and the consequences are there to see. So it's very difficult. It's because of the political capital or the political cost of regulating them. Uh, the governments are not able to do what they are supposed to be doing. So, so it's, it's, it's an area that needs to be looked at. Thank you. Okay, um, I'd like to go next uh, on the, in the attack. <laughs> well, look, let me, um, let me say this. I, I think the Nigerian issue is a case of really uh, not following the rules and trying to look at windfalls as if they were permanent income and try to consume them as they come. Now, uh, during the global crisis, um, 2008 or 2009, we had problems too. But at that time, there was the excess crude account 
from which government could draw. Just like in the example that uh, Alan was giving the case of Chile, uh, trying to, you know, he did that meaningfully. But again, you know, with the development of political class and so on, uh, governors are more interested in sharing whatever it is that's accumulated. Instead of maintaining the rules, keeping to the rules and regulations that when the price of oil is above a particular benchmark, you save the surplus. So when the rainy season comes, rainy periods do come, then of course you can go ahead and to benefit from it and use it to, you know, make the necessary adjustment for the economy until things, you know, get better again. That's the problem. So in each of these situations, the rules and regulations are there that all these excess funds should be saved. But then with the um, multiplicity of political class and people at top trying to argue among themselves, there had never been a very well thought out position of maintaining rigidity on you know, the maintenance of these funds. And that's what happened. Similarly true, uh, Nigeria was carrying what I call excess burden in terms of trying to subsidize petroleum. Of course, at the end of the day, that has to be removed. Instead of you know, paying 87 um, naira per liter, we are now paying 145 per liter because there was need for government to stop up this subsidy, which it was carrying for a very long time. Those are the problems. If those ones have been taken care of, there will have been enough room at every time to make adjustments when you have a good time and when you have a bad time and be able to make a appropriate adjustment in terms of government spending. Now, attitudinal changes, that's a big one. Now, uh, over the years, there have been development in terms of the oversized bureaucracy which Nigeria is carrying. And the toll now is so great in terms of how many people do you pay and so on. And also this attitude of, you know, cake sharing, cake sharing as opposed to cake baking. Uh, you know, uh, state governments are interested in going to the federation account share whatever it is there, allocate them to states, and then use them in a very reckless way that should be. So the kind of attitudinal changes I'm talking about then is for the political class to realize the need to eliminate waste, to eliminate fraudulent practices, to also eliminate you know, wastefulness in spending. In other words, efficiency in government spending it should be the rule of the game so that whatever resources you do have can go a lot further than had been in the past. And of course, if, if you do a lot of that, that requires a lot of attitudinal changes, as I said, making people realize the need to, uh, it's not the, uh, the citizens that should tighten their belts. Those are the political class have to tighten their belts too uh, by, you know, uh, uh, stopping to buy exotic cars or senators or senators having facilities both at home and the village and so on. Those are the kind of attitudinal changes I'm talking about. And indeed, a lot of people in Nigeria now are talking about this need for attitudinal changes, need for us to start again, as it were, going to the drawing board in terms of the right perspective to governance and right perspective to government spending. Thank you. I think there were two questions uh, directed at me. The first was about the uh, need to build in um, the sort of uh, climate change and the diversification uh, issues into strategy. And I think that's absolutely perfectly sensible uh, comment. And of course, it doesn't happen to the, anything like the extent that uh, it should do. Um, on diversification, I'm, you know, I've worked a little in Botswana. I've worked a little in Zambia. And I'm pretty conscious at my age that for the last 50 years, those, both of those countries have been talking about uh, diversification of their economies. But if you look at my data on export dependence, they haven't really made uh, terribly much progress uh, in, in, in that direction. Um, I think the advice to the newer uh, countries in Africa, like including uh, Tanzania, for example, which are you know, beginning to um, develop uh, sub substantial gas resources that they should almost have it on the, the walls of every minister, you know, that your task mm -hmm. in, in running the gas industry is to think of ways of diversifying away from gas over the next 40, 50 years, because you have a resource, it's there for a finite period of time, um, it's not going to be there forever, and when it's gone, you don't have that resource in terms of exports or government revenue, you need something else. This is your opportunity, and take the opportunity while you can, there are ways to do that. Governments tend not to put those labels on the offices of their ministers um, when they, they find these resources. Um, 
I think in terms of the um, climate change story, I, I, I personally find this really complex. I mean, for oil, clearly, uh, the climate change agendas that are now agreed internationally are going to uh, significantly reduce over time the use of uh, oil. But I'm not entirely clear what's going to happen to metals. Uh, indeed, some of the metals will be increased in demand by virtue of climate change agendas, the sort of metals that are required for um, wind turbines and so on uh, you know, are going to be different types of metals, but they will be demanded in increasing amounts. So I, I would have thought that the, um, that needs to be factored into strategies in countries that are endowed with these respective um, uh, resources. On the, on the question of the, the stabilization funds from uh, Andre Solomano, uh, this is a, a very, very important question, I believe. I mean, if you look at the countries in Africa in particular, where I'm more familiar, I'm not so familiar ones, the ones in Latin America that have sort of entered the ranks of um, being resource rich relatively recently, or countries like Nigeria indeed that entered a long while ago, they, they almost all have legislation about so sovereign wealth funds or stabilization funds. And if you look at the IMF, you know, they've done papers on fiscal rules. More and more countries, including low and middle income countries, have, have fiscal rules, which are designed to prevent these cyclical swings from uh, turning into fiscal d disasters. Th these rules exist. Ghana has very, very good legislation, um, the PRMA, which it, it, I understand it, it learned from look, copying Nigeria's, uh, some of Nigeria's legislation. The problem is it's not implemented. You know, you said the election was the reason why those fiscal deficits. I know it was the election. Of course it was the election. But it, it, the rules were nonetheless there. The politicians, you know, they were out of line. When they, when they forgot their own laws. Uh, so, but Andre makes a very serious point. Chile has a per capita income of $24,000. If it sets aside five or six percent of GDP, uh, the Minister of Finance gets a bit of a beating up in the newspapers, but he doesn't get fired. Um, but if you've got a per capita income of $750 or $1,000, I don't know what the figure in Tanzania is currently, but Donald, Donald will tell me. Can you really put aside one or two percent of GDP annually into a so-called sovereign wealth fund for the benefit of future generations? Politically, it's so, so difficult to do that. So I think there's a, there's a big distance between the, the quite sensible thinking and advice that has gone in about these stabilization funds. And I say the passing of laws and rules and, so, and, and the, the practice on the ground. Politicians, when they have an election, they need money, and they get money from whatever source they can find it. Um, I think that's it. Thank you. All right. So it's actually pretty difficult to stand here and defend the entire ecology and the tribal communities of all the countries of this sitting in this room. Uh, but yeah, the managing natural resources is something we talk about. How about ma managing the mining companies and some of these contracts which are being written out and so on? It's for each each uh, country to think of it, think of it, think through it uh, clearly. He was giving the example of the new countries which have found oil. If you look at the Gulf countries which had oil and uh, are exploiting it, have exploited it to such an extent, one fine day they're all going to be wiped out because they don't have anything else. They have not developed any other industry, or they really have to think through what they're going to do. So. Uh, in countries where you really don't, uh, you know, require that, but obviously there is um, an external uh, this thing. But you don't, uh, you know, extract this to the extent that you wipe out various communities. You wipe out. Uh, uh, you are only adding to another problem. You you wipe out the biodiversity here, here, not just here in every other place where they are ex extracting. You cannot replace that. You will figure that out in that day, like it's the same for GM plants and so on. You, you will figure out that all the indigenous rice varieties that you had, all the indigenous millet varieties that you had in a country like India, which I know best, if you don't preserve them, tomorrow when this disease comes, that disease comes, you will not have anything to fight it. You will not have any of those uh, genes left to be able to, which actually are resistant to those things, which can actually live in that place. It's the same thing applies here. You extract this, you get rid of this biodiversity, you get rid of those people, that's fine. They'll move away, uh, you find them a place, they'll move away. But basically you have destroyed something which you cannot, cannot replace. So is there some fashion in which something can be controlled so that uh, uh, extraction is also done in a slightly more, uh, if it needs to be done. 
Uh, because these things are not going to come back. Once you've taken out the uh, bauxite or the iron ore, it's not going to come in another million years. So uh, it's just something that has to be accounted for. We are today taking away all this. Uh, tomorrow, uh, so far we have always been dependent on science. We are absolutely certain that science will discover some other source of, uh, uh, yeah, of, um, of metal, some other source of uh, building your airplanes, uh, some other source of traveling, some other source of energy. We are absolutely convinced. But the fact remains that what you have, if one can preserve it to some fashion, and uh, that's the only way thing I can say. And the, the, I mean, there is, there is a path, but it's the more difficult path. Once you have opened up your economy, as long as India was not opened up, all these issues didn't arise. The mining companies could not come. So whatever was extracted here was extracted. The Tatas who have these steel companies, they were extracting the coal, they were extracting the iron ore, they were using it in India. It was building the infrastructure in India and it, it, uh, you, they might also have displaced communities. But at least it was here, the whole thing is just flowing out. All that the government is getting so, is some little bit of tax and royalty revenues, which is, which is pittance for the amount that, uh, of GDP growth that they already have. So I have no answer. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, panelists. I uh, thank you so much for uh, this. I think we deserve a round of applause. You have done so well. Uh,